Hello from ChemHelp ASAP. In this video, we'll perform an SN2 reaction of sodium azide as a nucleophile onto benzyl chloride as the electrophile to form benzyl azide, our tidal compound. This is one of the great SN2 reactions and just about impossible to mess up. This reaction uses sodium azide, which can have some toxicity, and forms a large amount of an alkyl azide, which can have its own safety issues. Therefore, I do not consider this to be an experiment I would advocate as something undergraduate graduates should perform. I do, however, need some of the reaction product, benzyl azide, for another reaction, so I thought I would rec record the reaction. This video is also an opportunity to talk about safety issues of certain types of compounds. I will say that two clips in this video have poor audio quality, as I forgot how to use my headset microphone. The captions for the video are accurate and complete. If you have trouble hearing the audio, please turn on the captions. I apologize for the inconvenience. Here is the reaction for this video. We are reacting benzyl chloride on the left with sodium azide to form benzyl azide as the product. This is an incredibly good SN2 reaction. The nucleophile, azide ion, is truly one of the great SN2 nucleophiles. The halide is very unhindered a primary halide. Furthermore, the halide has no beta hydrogens. So there is absolutely no concern of a competing E2 reaction. Finally, the reactivity of the alkyl halide is enhanced through something called the phenacyl effect. The pi system of the benzene ring is in a position to stabilize the transition state of the SN2 reaction so that the reaction is especially fast. Although this is a very easy and high yielding reaction, I mentioned some safety concerns in the opening of this video. Many chemists, when someone mentions making azides, will raise their eyebrows because azide chemistry can indeed include some safety risks. Let's talk about these risks. Let's first focus on the use of azide salts, metal azide salts. Our reaction relies on sodium azide, NaN3. Sodium azide is fairly stable, but with extreme heating, it can detonate with a release of nitrogen gas, N2. Sodium azide is often used as a trigger for the discharge of airbags in automobiles, and the azide explosion is activated through he the heating of a wire. While sodium azide is relatively safe under most laboratory conditions, other salts like lead azide and copper azide are both very explosive and very unstable. Lead and copper azide are sometimes formed when sodium azide solutions are not disposed properly. If sodium azide waste is regularly dumped down a drain that contains copper or lead pipes, lead or copper azide can build up over time and eventually lead to an explosion. Another risk of azide salts is if the salts are exposed to acid. Azide can be protonated to form HN3, hydrozoic acid. Hydrozoic acid is very toxic, even at low concentrations, and can cause a person to lose consciousness. Based on these ideas, azide salts and waste from azide reactions must be handled correctly to minimize safety risks. Organic azide products can also have safety risks. Organoazides are potentially explosive. Well, that's interesting because we are making an organoazide in today's reaction. Not all organoazides are considered explosive. In general, and general rules always have exceptions, organoazides are normally relatively stable if the molecule contains at least six carbons per azide group. Note that our product contains seven carbon atoms, so our product satisfies this general rule. What would make a molecule an exception to the rule? Well, molecules with double bonds and triple bonds, which can react with the azide, are often less stable. Our structure, with its benzene ring, likely carries a bit more risk than expected. Fortunately, benzyl azide is very well known in the literature and is widely used as an azide. In order to minimize risks, we will avoid excessive heat with our product, especially heating the final isolated product in its pure form. Laboratory explosions involving azides are uncommon, but are occasionally reported. Many explosions arise around a specific transformation, the conversion of an alcohol into 
an azide. Despite their safety concerns, azides are a very useful functional group. You can do a lot of cool reactions with azides. Therefore, it's common to want to transform a very common functional group, an alcohol, into an azide. A common approach to this reaction is to convert the alcohol into a leaving group, such as a tosylate. This reaction is very mild, tolerates many other functional groups, and is simple to perform and high yielding. The resulting tosylate is a great leaving group for an SN2 reaction and formation of the desired azide. Okay, well, what's the problem? The tosylate forming reaction uses methylene chloride, CH2Cl2, as the solvent. Sometimes, if the chemist is not careful, some methylene chloride will remain as an impurity in the tosylate product. Here's the problem. Methylene chloride readily reacts with sodium azide to form diazidomethane. Look at the structure of diazidomethane. The molecule contains just one carbon with two azide groups. This molecule violates our rule of thumb. It is very explosive if formed. This molecule, diazidomethane, is believed to be responsible for many lab explosions involving azide research. While making organoazides can involve some safety risks, we will carefully avoid those risks as much as possible. For example, in our reaction today, we will not use any methylene chloride in the reaction. So let's begin to weigh out some of our reagents. I say some, there's two reagents. So the first is going to be benzyl chloride. Benzyl chloride, this is a big bottle of benzyl chloride. Um, benzyl chloride is not, it's not a bad <laughs> reagent, but um, very often people will work with benzyl bromide instead. Benzyl bromide will empty a laboratory. It's, um, it's a very potent lacrimator and will cause you to cry. I mean, if, if it's spilled in a lab or used sloppily in a lab, you really can't work in there because it's, it will really bring literal tears to your eyes. Benzyl chloride is kind of the little brother of benzyl bromide. It's, um, it's just simply not as reactive because that chloride is not, it's not, not as good of a leaving group. Regardless, we'll work with it efficiently. And we want to get about 20 grams of this material. And once we get it weighed out here, note that typically I wouldn't weigh out quantities like this, but... Uh, it's sometimes the balance is just very convenient. We could work with the density and get it as a volume, and that's fine, but for something like this, I'm a pretty big fan of just using the balance. Now, we are weighing this out in a an Erlenmeyer flask. This is going to be our reaction flask, so I'm just dumping this reagent in here. We're up to about 15 grams. I'm going to add a stir bar, and... Then I'll take this over to the hood, and uh, we'll add some solvent, and then we'll be set. So we want about 20 grams. That's going to be 150 to 160 millimoles, which is a big scale for this, but I need a lot of it. And that is 20.5. Oh five grams. That's perfect. Uh, again, we don't need this number to be super exact. We just need to know exactly what we're working with. So let's add in our, let's lift it up, not drop it in from a height. There is our stir bar and lots of benzyl chloride. And let's quickly get this over to the hood and then we'll go ahead and take care of our azide. So wonderful. So the benzyl chloride is now in the hood. Uh, even though Benzyl chloride won't make you cry. There's no reason not to get it in the hood quickly. So we minimize our exposure. And now let's go to our azide. This is sodium azide. Just as we use quite a bit of benzyl chloride, 20 grams, we're going to use quite a bit of sodium azide. We're going to use uh, just over 12 grams. Now, when I weigh out quantities like this, 12 grams, weighing paper doesn't cut it for 12 grams of material. I need something firmer. So very often I like to just, just get a glass beaker. And um, this is a solid. It's a white solid. So I'm going to open it up. And I'm just going to tap it out right into the beaker. 
we need a little over 12 grams. This, this reagent is going to be in excess, about a 20% excess. So this doesn't need to be exact. Again, I just want to get an amount and know exactly what I used. Anything over, say, 12 grams is going to be adequate for this reaction. So we're up to 9 grams. 10. This is, this is a lot of sodium azide. 11. I know this is just great watching. Uh, watching someone measure some. 12.2. I wanted 12.3. That is 12.397. Let's just call that 12.40. Uh, so that's all the azide we need with that we need. Now we'll take this off. We'll go into the hood and we'll get um, add our solvent and add our azide and get this reaction started. We now have everything that we need in the hood to get this reaction started. So here is our Erlenmeyer flask and it has approximately 20 grams of benzyl chloride in it. Let's go ahead and add in some DMF. This is going to be our main solvent for this SN2 reaction. It's a nice polar aprotic solvent. Now I'm being careful, but I'm not going to be exact in my amounts. I just want about 100 milliliters. There we go. Try not to spill it. And let's pour this in. So DMF, DMSO, these are two great solvents for SN2 reactions. So that's a nice solution of our benzyl chloride. And I actually want a little bit more than that. I want about 125 milliliters. So I don't normally deal with larger volumes than that with a graduate. So let's get another 25 here. Reasonably close. Doesn't have to be exact. We're going to end up having about a one molar solution of our chloride. Okay. Perfect. Maybe not perfect, but certainly good enough. Now we need to add in um, another solvent. I'm going to add in a little bit of water. Tell you what, let's add the azide first. Show you why we do this. So this azide, this is a pretty good amount of powder. I don't want to try to freehand dump it into the Erlenmeyer flask. Maybe I can do that, maybe I can't, but it's much easier if we just use a funnel. Now I did take some time to make sure that some of the chunks were broken up. So there were some big lumps that came out of the sodium azide bot bottle and I made sure that those were powdered. Keep this stirring. Now you notice there's a lot of solid in there. That solid is our sodium azide that's not really dissolving. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some water to this. And if you've learned about SN2 reactions you might say oh no you, you don't want water in there because water is a polar product solvent. And polar product solvents are bad for SN2 reactions. Well, sometimes you need to dissolve your reagents. You need to dissolve your salts. So we're going to throw some water in here. The great thing is, is that a polar protic solvent may make some nucleophiles more basic. But sodium azide is just so non-basic. It's no problem. But that gets everything in solution. You can see the solution is clearing up a little bit. Let me get this stirring a little bit better. And I, th I think that's actually reacting before our eyes. So part of this reaction, we're going to form a side product of sodium chloride. And sodium chloride may not be completely soluble. So we, as, as the sodium azide dissolves in solution and things react, we might see precipitation of sodium chloride as a side product. I'm not saying that's complete at this point, but that, I think that explains some of the cloudiness. So now we have everything mixed. This looks great. We have about 20 grams of benzyl, benzyl chloride, maybe 12 or so grams of sodium azide. That's a slight excess of the azide, and it's dissolved in 125 milliliters of DMF and an additional 25 milliliters of water. So let's let this stir. I'm going to warm this up. Let's set this up to about 100. Let's go 130. Now, just because the hot plate is 130 doesn't mean that the Erlenmeyer flask is 130. There's a lot of airflow here and it's being actively cooled by that air. Regardless, we just want a decent amount of heat into this flask. You know, if this thing were to get up to 
70 or so degrees that would be great but this is going to be a very quick reaction we'll let this stir as it heats and then we'll come back and in a little bit and we'll end the reaction and and try to isolate the product the reaction has now been going for about two and a half hours and uh, there's a couple changes I point out one it, it's gotten more uniformly cloudy um, I believe that is uh, that's the formation of sodium chloride in the reaction so that's uh, in aqueous DMF it's not terribly soluble so you see that salt precipitate forming um, another thing I point out is I've turned the heat down I checked this after about half an hour and um, you know this isn't a perfect way to check temperature but sometimes if you just lightly touch something if if it's too hot to to hold or touch comfortably you're probably up above 60 degrees Celsius or so and so when this was getting hot I I touched it and it was just that was a little bit hotter than I really wanted it to be hot, honestly hotter than was necessary for it to be so I knocked down the temperature on the hot plate this might be a little lower than I want but at least I know in my mind it got at least 30 minutes of some pretty good heat now I, I think all this is kind of irrelevant because I think this is a pretty quick reaction uh, almost probably progresses at room temperature but anyway I just want to make sure it gets enough heat to do what it needs to do to do this SN2 reaction so now I, I think this is complete I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the heat let this cool down and then we can go through the isolation process on this on this reaction unfortunately the next two clips have kind of bad audio you can use the CC button the closed caption button in the YouTube player and that will activate the captions I apologize for the poor audio quality this is now all nice and cool uh, there is no change at all to report but now we have a problem we, we need to get our product out of here there ought to be a lot of our azide in this reaction and it's all mixed in with different salts and uh, mostly a lot of DMF. DMF is a great organic solvent. However, most organic solvents that you commonly encounter in the lab, they're fairly volatile. So you can evaporate away the solvent and get your product. DMF is really high boiling. And so you can't just evaporate it away. So we're gonna have to do a liquid liquid extraction on this. We're gonna have to do a traditional workup on this reaction using a separatory funnel to separate our product, our very non-polar product, from the very polar DMF and water solution that uh, our product is right now dissolved in. So that's the next step. We need to do a large scale extraction to get um, our compound extracted into an organic layer, a volatile organic layer, so we can isolate this product. Okay, this is gonna be a lot of work, so be comfortable and we'll see how this goes. So I, we're gonna do an extraction. We need to dilute this mixture, which is mostly DMF, into a mixture of ether and water. Now ether is less dense, it's gonna to flow to the top and this is a big separatory funnel. We're gonna do all our work in this big piece of glassware. So when we mix with this with water and ether, everything in there is gonna to have to make a choice. Is everything in there, do they, reagents in here want to go into ether or water our product is going to go into ether so it's going to float into the less dense layer the other things like the salts and the DMF are going to go into the more dense aqueous layer but first we got to mix this thing up so here is our stuff there's our precious product going in. Of course, we haven't done anything except for transferred it at this point. There go all those salts. I'm gonna to try to keep this stir bar out of there, but if it sneaks in, that's okay. Okay, that's not everything, but now, see there's a lot of water in here, so let's give it a little water. Now, hopefully all these salts will pretty much dissolve in water. And this is pretty common. When, when you transfer something, we're gonna, since we have to add a lot of solvent to this separatory funnel, we're going to go ahead and initially put the solvents in here and then transfer it and that makes sure we get everything rinsed out of rinsed out of our reaction flask, our Erlenmeyer flask. Oops, oh, there's that sneaky stir bar that happens. So we also need to rinse with a little bit of water, uh, ether, excuse me, this is ether, diethyl ether. 
we'll swirl this around. Dump this in. We'll give a little more water and we'll go back and forth between water and ether. Might move a little less slowly where we not on camera. It's just not always fun to watch solutions transfer on camera. Here's some ether. Now we're not going to fill this set funnel up with other solvents, but, but we're certainly going to add plenty. We want to make sure our product is nicely diluted. Okay, I think we've rinsed this out pretty well. It's done its job. See you later. Now let's go ahead and just add solvents in here directly. This is all ether, nice non-polar solvent, and we're going to add quite a bit. We need to add quite a bit because we want our layers to be distinct. We want this layer, even, even though it contains our product, to be mostly ether. And the bottom layer, even though it contains some DMF, we want it to be mostly water. We want to make everything make a choice. So we'll throw a lot of water in here. And of course we've got a lot of ether. Now let's just see how well this works. I'm gonna put the top into this sub funnel. This is a lot of weight, so I'm gonna, this is definitely a two-hand job. Take this out. Now, as soon as I start mixing this, this is gonna build up some pressure because that tends to happen in sub funnels. So the first thing I'm gonna do is turn it upside down. And I'm going to open up the top. Oh, it gave a little, little uh, hiss, a little burp. So now I'm going to mix it with the top open, and I hope this comes out. But I'm going to mix it with the top open so it can, the pressure can release. Now, once I've given it a chance to release some, I'm going to go ahead and close this off. Give it a good shake. There is a stir bar in there. It's okay. Now that we let it initially mix with the stopcock open we're fine and and we want to we want to mix it intentionally this isn't just a little baby shake this is we want these these two layers to intimately mix okay that looks great now let's see how that looks I don't know if you can see but there are two layers the, the the layers are pretty clear so it's not terribly obvious but there is a division right there this is a lot of aqueous layer on the bottom hopefully that contains most of our DMF and on the top is the ether layer hopefully containing our product so now I need to I need to fit this receiver flask on the bottom so let's raise this up I might lose the top of the sub funnel from the camera but that's okay there's not much to see there I'm gonna let this drain down and this would go a whole lot faster if it weren't for that crazy stir bar getting in the way but that's okay we, we can outweigh that stir bar and what I'm looking at is this line that's our division line our phase change and we have to let this drain all the way down to here now, I'm going to wash this multiple times with water. So, I'm going to cut a little bit short if I leave a little water behind. That's okay, because I'm going to throw more water in the top. We just want to get the bulk of this out. This first wash is probably the most critical, because for this first wash, I'll, we're removing a whole lot of DMF. So, this is like water and a lot of DMF. The subsequent washes will be mostly water. Okay, I think our phase is in here. There it is. It, it's really, it's very hard to see. It's, an, it's a very clear separation, but since it's, you know, two, two co almost colorless layers, it's hard to see. It's coming down right here. You don't want to lose sight of that because, because that's where your product is. Your pro our product is above that. And it's coming down. I'm going to slow it down. That's pretty good. Tell you what, let's do one more of these. I'm actually going to do four more of these. Multiple washes with water. I won't use as much water this second time. The first extraction does most of the work. Put the top on. Bring this back down in frame. Let's turn it upside down. Not shaking. Oh boy, look at that vent. So we let it vent a little bit. 
swirl it around, let it vent all that it wants. And now when we shake it up, it won't build up quite as much pressure. A little bit, not too much. Okay. And you want to always point this stuff away from people so you don't spray them. Because remember, we, we have some different reagents in here. We, we have some azide in here, and, and we just spray that all over ourselves or surfaces in the lab. Okay, and let's let this drain down. Again, it won't be super fast. Here's our line. Now, you, you can't move with the camera to see the line, but if you can move up and down, move your perspective up and down, it's a little easier to see if there's a separation there. Going great. I think it's a little clearer now. I won't get it all the way down there. Okay, great. Now, we don't have to show this on camera. I'm gonna do this three more times. I'm gonna rinse more and more water. What I'm trying to do is make sure none of that DMF is hiding in this ether layer. We're gonna get all that DMF out. And then once we do, ether is nice and volatile. We'll be able to evaporate the ether and what'll be left behind is our crude, hopefully pretty clean product. So let's do this three more times. I'll do it off camera and then we'll come back. All right, well, here we are. Everything is rinsed. So this has been washed multiple times, five times total, extracted with water. Whoops. And here is all that aqueous layer that we collected. Now, th this is waste. This contains uh, some azide salts. So we want to be careful when we dispose of this waste that we tag it so that people know don't mix with this, this with acids. Don't mix it with any other metal salts. It's a sodium salt right now, which is fine. But that's, that is waste. That is no longer of central interest to us. What is of interest is what's in this sub funnel. And so this is our ether layer containing our product. I'm going to drain that out. Now there's still a little bit of water in here. There are water droplets that are clinging to the side of the flask. Some of those are going to come down in here. That's okay. We, we can take care of that water. We can dry that out with um, a drying agent. But we need to collect this whole layer. And in fact, we're not going to be satisfied with just draining this out. We don't want to leave any residue of product in there. So we're going to have to have a way to collect that product. And again, Mr. Sturbar is making his presence felt. Just slowing things down a little bit, eh, but that's okay. Okay, almost done. I always say I'm not going to let the Sturbar go into the sub funnel, but you know, I almost always do. Okay, so we'll just give this a little bit of rinse by splashing around a little bit of ether in here. And that will complete our transfer. Open it up to let that vent and just swirl that around a little bit. Okay, that's that's good enough. It's always important to drop this slowly. You don't want to chip chip the end of your sep funnel on whatever's underneath it. Okay, great. That's gonna be everything. We'll let that drain out. Now you might ask yourself, you know, a lot of the reactions I do on the channel, they, they just give these nice precipitates. Why are we having to do something different? Well, this product is, is a liquid. It's not a solid, so it will not uh, precipitate out like all these others have. So let's put this down over here gently, but quickly. Okay, now, so anyway, th this is a liquid, so we can't precipitate it. So we have to go through this workup process. I don't know what that looks like to you, but that looks fairly clear, but ether, ether should be clearer than that. And our problem is, is we have some water in here. So I'm gonna add some drying agent to this. This is not a precise process. We just wanna add some drying agent. This is magnesium sulfate. What this does is it chemically binds the water on that ma on the magnesium, and that removes it from our from our ether solution. 
You might say, well, great. Now, now instead of getting rid of water, we got to get rid of the magnesium sulfate. You're right, we do. But this is pretty easy just to filter away. And once we filter it away, we'll be left with ether, which contains hopefully just our product, maybe impurities, but basically just our product. So we'll let that dry for a second. It's very fast. And then we'll come back and we'll do a filtration and we'll start to uh, think about how we get rid of the ether. Okay, so on the right, this is our our ether solution of our product over drying agent, the magnesium sulfate, and that's nice and dry, ready to be filtered. And on the left is a 500 milliliter round bottom flask with a funnel and just a piece of filter paper. So this is not a Buchner funnel. We are not collecting the solid because we're interested in keeping the solid. We want the liquid and we just want to remove the solid. So we're going to do a gravity filtration on this, on this um, solution. So I'm not going to, I don't have enough space in this round bottom flask to collect all of this. So my goal is to filter enough of this to fill the flask about halfway. So I'm going to have to do this in multiple portions because there's more than half a flask worth of ether in this flask. So let's just wait. Gravity filtrations tend to go generally pretty quickly. Our goal is to get this about halfway filled. Uh, you know, I hope I don't go too much over, but about half is what you want in a round bottom flask. And then what we're going to do is we're going to evaporate this liquid. Now, this round bottom, fla round bottom flask, I know the mass of that. It weighs about 150 grams. It's important to know the tear weight of the empty flask because what we're going to do, we're going to evaporate all the ether out of this and the residue that's left is going to be our product. And of course, we want to know how much product we got. So we have to know we'll get a total mass. We'll subtract out the tear weight of the flask and that'll tell us how much product we got um, from this extraction process, from this workup. Well, that is just about bang on the money. So we'll put this back over here. We're going to need that again because we have more to filter. But let's take care of this residue uh, or this solution now. We're going to try to evaporate it down. For that, we'll have to go to the rotary evaporator, colloquially known as the Rotovap. Okay, we are at the Rotovap. And I've shown this in another video. I won't go into too much detail. But what we're doing is we are warming up what's in that flask. Now, what's in that flask is mostly ether, but it also contains our product. Ether is fairly volatile, and so by drawing a vacuum or a partial vacuum in this glassware system, we will evaporate the ether, but we won't draw such a strong vacuum or heat this up so much that we actually evaporate our, our product. So we're sort of on a line. Fortunately, there's a big difference in boiling point between our product and ether. And it, ether is great for this because ether is super low boiling. It boils around 35 degrees Celsius, um, j just barely above room temperature. So it's very easy to remove the ether. We'll leave behind our product. Now again, uh, I'll evaporate this until we run out of ether in the flask. But then of course, I need to filter the, the, the main solution again, and maybe even again, because I'll have to rotovap this down in portions. But that's okay. The idea is we're going to remove the volatile impurities, and the solvent right now is, and it is an impurity, um, and what we'll be left with is a residue of our product. And then we can analyze the product and see if it looks good, if it looks clean, and whether we can carry it on in another reaction. Well, here in the far back of the hood, here is our empty flask. This used to have all that ether solution in it. It doesn't anymore. It's all been filtered and transferred into this round bottom flask. And the con all the ether has been rotovapped off. And here is what's left. This is our residual oil. That is 19.36 grams of oil. That's a very high yield. Honestly, this is a uh, this is a great reaction. It's an SN2 reaction on benzyl chloride. I mean, that's that's a, uh, with azide, a fantastic uh, SN2 nucleophile. Regardless, that's an extremely high yield. So what's left is to actually determine the purity of this material. Um, I won't be taking a melting point because this material is not a solid. I won't be taking a TLC because it's maybe a little bit too volatile to 
see on TLC over time, but we can certainly take an NMR, and an NMR will tell us everything we need, and if we wanted to be more thorough, we could do things like look at it by GC and that sort of thing. But NMR will answer us just fine. My only concern is that we have a lot of ether left in here. I don't think we do, but that is probably my biggest concern. So we'll get an NMR of this material and see what we have. Here is the full NMR spectrum. Our product is a simple molecule, and the NMR spectrum is fairly simple. In the 7 to 8 ppm range, we have the five aromatic ring hydrogens. The CH2 next to the azide has no neighbors and is a singlet around 4.45 ppm. Note that the singlet should be two hydrogens. The scale is set to one on the NMR spectrum. The integration is half of what we would expect. Therefore, the five aromatic hydrogens are also scaled to just half of what we would expect with a value around 2.5. As usual, our spectrum was attained in DMSO. As the NMR solvent, the signal down at 3.5 is water. In our DMSO solvent, the signal at around 2.5 ppm is the residual DMSO signal. These are not part of our molecule. There are some impurities in the reaction. These blips around 1.33 ppm and maybe 3.5 ppm. These are actually impurities from the ether that we used to work up the reaction and isolate the product. Ether almost always introduces low level of low levels of impurities. These do not significantly compromise the purity of our product, but it's still important to recognize that th what they are and their origin. Overall, this is a very clean reaction product. Although clean, this product is regardless still considered a crude product because the product has not been purified by distillation, chromatography, or recrystallization. When a product is both crude and yet fairly clean, chemists will often say something like, the product was clean enough to be used without purification. That is code for, we could have purified it, but we were satisfied it was already clean enough for our purposes. Now that we know the product is pure enough for our needs, let's go ahead and calculate the reaction yield. So we started with 20.05 grams of benzyl chloride. The molecular weight is 126.58 grams per mole, that means we used 158.4 millimoles of benzyl chloride. Sodium azide was our other reagent. We used 12.40 grams of sodium azide. The molecular weight is 65.01 grams per mole, so we used 190.7 millimoles of sodium azide. These reagents react in a one-to-one -one ratio. So benzyl chloride is our limonene reagent. And our theoretical yield is 158.4 millimoles. For our product, we obtained 19.36 grams. Benzyl azide has a molecular weight of 133.15 grams per mole, so we made 145.4 millimoles of product. This is our actual yield. To calculate our percent yield, we use the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100 to get a 92% yield. Not bad, but of course, this is one of the all-time great SN2 reactions. The yield for this reaction should indeed be very high. I hope you found this demonstration of an azide synthesis and discussion of azide safety interesting. While azides are notoriously dangerous, they can be used safely and are incredibly useful reagents. Please subscribe, like, or leave a comment. Take care.